All right. Hi, this is Dr. Daria. Thank you so much for joining us on the Hope Flies Health Series webinar on Parkinson's and mitochondrial disease. April is Parkinson's Awareness Week, and as part of increasing awareness, the Foundation for Mitochondrial Medicine has organized this great webinar on Parkinson's and mitochondrial disease. Today, Parkinson's researchers are finding an increasing scientific connection and interest in mitochondria. And we'll specifically hear about a research project the, the FMM and the Michael J. Fox Foundation have co-founded with the Discovery Foundation exploring this link. We'll be discussing similar challenges mitochondrial patients and Parkinson's patients face and how the day-to-day -day can be managed while treatment options are still being researched in the laboratory. So just for a quick overview, each speaker is going to present their various topics. And then during the last 15 minutes of the presentation, we'll open it up for some Q&A and answer some Q&A that have already been submitted as well. So we'll do some quick introductions. I'm Dr. Daria Longolespi. I'm an emergency room doctor at Northside Hospital, and I'm SVP of Clinical Strategy at ShareCare, which is a health and engagement platform and home of the real age test, which everybody needs to, I want everyone to go take because you can learn your body's real age and get actionable information for keeping it younger. I'm also author of the Busy Woman's Guide to Health and Sanity on the Huffington Post, and I'm host of ShareCare Radio. To listen to our interview yesterday on mitochondrial diseases, go to sharecare.com backslash RadioMD. Now, we are at ShareCare are partners with the Foundation for Mitochondrial Medicine, and I'm a mom myself, so I'm really excited to host today's webinar, and I hope you can learn more and find more content from them. I know you can find it on ShareCare, and I know you'll learn more today. Remember, if you have further questions, tweet everybody at, found, at, at FoundMM or tweet me at Dr. Daria. And we may not always be able to respond live, but we will reach out afterwards. You can be certain. So let me introduce our fantastic panelists today. I have first Dr. Wolf Dieter Springer. He's an assistant professor of neuroscience at Mayo Clinic Jacksonville. Now, the research interests of Dr. Springer revolve around cell biology in aging and age-dependent disorders. His primary research focus is on the molecular and cellular mechanisms underlying the pathogenesis of Parkinson's disease and other related neurodegenerative disorders. So he's looking into Parkinson's and all of that to find solutions. Now, functional insights gained through his research are going to provide the basis to address really unmet medical needs, such as identifying faithful biomarkers and developing new therapeutic strategies that halt or prevent devastating neurodegenerative diseases. So really amazing stuff that we all need. I also have with us Laura Stanley. She's executive director for the Foundation for Mitochondrial Medicine. Now, she joined the FMM back in January 2010 as their first executive director. Laura's professional experiences in corporate human resources, sales and marketing, but when her oldest son was diagnosed in 2009 with a mitochondrial disease, you can bet that she wanted to find some answers. She wanted to find some hope and for a way to accelerate action. And lastly, but not least, I have Bill Wilkins. He's founder of the Wilkinson's Parkinson's Foundation. Now, Bill was himself diagnosed with Parkinson's in 2006, so he knows firsthand about the disease and has worked tirelessly for treatment ever since his diagnosis. In addition to his fundraising and advocacy efforts through the Wilkins Parkinson Foundation, he's also a charter member of Emory University's Udall Parkinson's Disease Research Center's Community Outreach Board and serves on the Patient Advisory Council for the Michael J. Fox Foundation. Now, the, Wilkinson, the Wilkins Parkinson's Foundation is a 501c3 charity dedicated to funding programs to raise awareness of Parkinson's disease. And it's the foundation's belief that increased awareness creates a general groundswell of support for the entire Parkinson's community, from research to patient care to education and support groups, the entire gamut. So that's our great panel. I want to just dive in for this webinar. Laura, how about you get us started by showing the connection between mitochondrial disease and Parkinson's? Sure. Thanks so much, Daria. Um, this is what we call our web of connectivity. And at FMM, we like to use this image on a variety of different materials that we have because what it really shows is that mitochondrial dysfunction, which is a big, long, complicated word, and oftentimes people uh, kind of glaze over when they hear the word mitochondria, uh, you'll learn much more about that today, everyone, but the point is that mitochondrial dysfunction is really at the center of so many related diseases and so many diseases that are often much more familiar to people. Uh, so I thought it would be kind of fun to play this little game. If everybody can look at this web of connectivity 
um, and just um, notice all of the different diseases where you most likely have a friend or family member that's impacted by one of these diseases. And just for fun, jot down the number of people that you know who have one of these diseases. So think about it. Do you know a child with autism or do you have a friend whose child might have autism or a grandchild with autism? How about Parkinson's? We're here to talk about Parkinson's specifically today. One in 500 people have Parkinson's. Alzheimer's, I think the numbers are more like one in 85. Um, Lou Gehrig's, we all heard about the ice bucket challenge last year or the year before, and I think one in 50,000 people have Lou Gehrig's um, or ALS. But the point is, we are all connected. So um, if you want to go ahead and do this and mark down the number of people that you know who have one of these diseases, add up the number, tally it all together, and that's going to be what we call your total firefly number. If you want to submit your total firefly number now on our YouTube channel or our Google Hangouts account, uh, we'll take note of that or even our Facebook page after the webinar and we'll send you a prize uh, for the one who's got the most firefly connections. Thank you. Thanks, Laura. Yeah, those, those numbers, when you put those all together from you know Parkinson's to cardiomyopathy and autism and then you include diabetes, I mean all of us know not just one or two, but dozens of people who are struggling with these. So I'm really glad we're talking about this. Now I want to turn to Dr. Springer to dive deeper specifically into Parkinson's. So let us know more about that. Sure. Thank you, Daria. Um, as mentioned by Laura, Parkinson's disease is really the second most common neurodegenerative disorder. After Alzheimer's disease, and it's more than that, it's the, the most common movement disorder, and it probably affects about one to two percent of the general population over the age of 65. Um, in, in the US it's probably more than a million individuals that are affected by Parkinson's disease and about 60,000 um, are diagnosed each year with Parkinson's. And just to give you an overview or the history of Parkinson's that uh, it was initially described by James Parkinson in, in, in 1870 on the previous slide is shown that um, the, the cardinal symptoms of Parkinson's disease are listed, and it's bradykinesia, um, the slowness of movement or rigidity, uh, the stiffness in the limbs, um, the resting tremor in the extremities, and, and postural instability. Typically, Parkinson's disease presents with an asymmetric onset and is also characterized by a good response to levodopa, which is currently the, the um, gold treatment. On the next slide we see that it's again illustrated it's a movement, movement disorder but it's more than that as it presents with many more other non-motor symptoms including hyposmia or the reduced ability to, to smell and detect odors. Um, it also can be considered an intestinal disorder um, and with constipation. Cardiac denervation is a current feature of, in, in patients and even come with depression or anxiety. Um, in some cases even with um, dementia. On the next slide we see that a, a, a macroscopic view of um, the pathology of Parkinson's disease and it's characterized by basically a selective loss of um, pigmented neurons in, in the midbrain within the region that is called substantia nigra um, due to these pigment and, and on the upper um, image we see P is the patient, uh, um, the substantial nigra label from a patient versus C, the control, and you see there's a lot of loss of this pigmented um, neurons in, in, the, in the area. Um, on, a, on a microscopic level, and this has been described by Friedrich Louis, um, uh, PD is characterized mainly by so-called Louis bodies named after him or Louis neurites. These are proteinaceous inclusions in um, the remaining cells that have not yet degenerated and it kind of indicates that um, there's a problem with protein homeostasis and there's a lot of protein aggregation in those cells as well as mitochondrial dysfunction that over time eventually lead to, to death of those um, cells. One of the major constituents of these Lewy bodies is a, a protein called alpha-synuclein um, in which mutation and multiplication has also been found to directly link to Parkinson's disease, so it's the cause of Parkinson's disease. And um, another protein, a famous one that is in those found in those inclusions, is is ubiquitin. I'm going to talk about this later on a bit more. A bit more. Um, on the next slide, it, it shows basically the the connectivity of this 
brain region that degenerates specifically in Parkinson's disease where um, dopaminergic neurons, so these are neurons that degenerate here um, and produce the neurotransmitter dopamine that is secreted. Those send projections to other brain regions um, in this striatum, um, mainly to the putamen and caudate regions. And um, these are regions that control motor activities. Um, and essentially, dopamine acts to um, release an inhi inhibition of the motor that is controlled by this area. So um, less dopamine in, in patients um, affects movement in those patients. So there's a real cause and consequence of the pathology and the loss of dopaminergic neurons and loss of this um, uh, neurotransmitter that regulates um, motor activity. That's why the cardinal symptoms are mainly motor problems. And it, it nowadays can also be not only seen in postmortem studies, but with new imaging techniques. Um, as, for example, shown on the right side, where um, fluorescently labeled dopamine uh, molecules um, can be visualized in, in patients, in the brains of patients. And on the left side of, of this panel, you see a healthy control um, that has a lot of uptake of dopamine um, in these red areas. And, and in the middle, you see a, a, an early Parkinson's patient that has um, kind of reflects the asymptomatic onset. Uh, on one side, at least, there's more diffuse and more green signal, and it's not as concentrated anymore. And in an advanced uh, stage patient, um, the signal is, is, is relatively reduced, and it's, it's, um, it's very diffuse. On the next slide, so this happens basically when um, a lot of or, or symptoms manifest in those Parkinson's disease patients when already a lot of those dopaminergic neurons have been lost and a lot of dopamine has been lost. That's when initially the patients would um, present with symptoms. But so far as of today, we have a very effective treatment of the symptoms, but not really of the causes, simply because we just don't understand why those uh, dopaminergic neurons degenerate. Um, and the current research aims really at understanding the causes of Parkinson's disease in order to come up with a disease-modifying strategy that not only treats the symptoms, the motor problems, but really prevents the degeneration of those neurons um, from the beginning. So this cartoon describes the basic treatment that is available as of today, and it, everything revolves around dopamine and, and metabolism of dopamine. So what is highlighted in red is L-dopa or levodopa, this is the most effective treatment that's given to patients, basically to replace um, endogenous dopamine that is missing because of the degeneration of those neurons. And then there are other treatments that complement this um, that would affect metabolism of, of dopamine or reuptake of dopamine. But again, really, the, going forward, it will be critical to find cures, or those should be based on an understanding of, of the underlying disease mechanism. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Springer. And you're right, it's getting to where we are right now of treating the symptoms of it, but the really the forefront is identifying that cause of the, the pathology with the dopamine so you can address them even earlier. So that's really wonderful. Thank you. Um, getting to talking about causes and uh, pathophysiology, Laura, talk to us about mitochondrial disease and you know, the symptoms and diagnosis of it. Absolutely. Well, I'll start with these images here. Um, so if we were um, in a classroom and everybody could raise their hand, I would have you guess what these are and maybe what they have in common. So the first image on the left is the uh, classic power plant, right? Um, so that's where our energy is actually produced for homes and businesses. Um, to the right, we have an image of a cartoon image of the mitochondria, which is part of our cells that actually is making the image. And then down in the bottom, we have our cute little firefly. Uh, some people in the south call them lightning bugs. And if you notice, the tail of the lightning bug is shining bright, making energy, right, glowing. And that's happening, interestingly enough, because the mitochondria in the firefly's tail 
creating um, something called luciferase, and that's what's making it glow. So that's giving the energy this firefly needs to glow. So interestingly, you've got a power plant, you've got something in the, the cells of the body and the firefly that have um, the mitochondrial function all in common here. So these are just some images to help everybody start to understand what mitochondria do. So on the next slide, um, we'll talk really about mitochondrial disease. And um, as, as Dr. Springer described, Parkinson's is, in short, a movement disorder or um, a motor problem. Well, mitochondrial disease is an energy production problem. So if you think about the power plants and you think about the fireflies' tail glowing, you notice that there's this um, commonality of energy. So if I can leave everybody with one or two things today to understand and remember about mitochondrial disease, it's really about energy or rather lack of energy. Um, so it's actually the most common inherited metabolic disease, but it's not always inherited. Um, and what it means is that really our cells have this energy crisis. Um, it's as if the body is having the uh, power failure. Um, so on our next slide, we've got really some description of the spectrum. Um, the mitochondria really represent a very complicated enzyme system, and I am far from a scientist, so Dr. Springer might be able to elaborate a little bit on this, but the mitochondrial system itself requires over a thousand genes to function properly. So what that means is that patients can present in so many different ways. Um, so there's not just one poster child or adult of mitochondrial disease. Um, it can present really at any age, whether it's teenagers, um, infants, um, adults, um, really any, any uh, organ can be affected and the symptoms can range from mild to fatal. Um, it's actually more common than childhood cancer and our, our affected um, or uh, stats around how many people are affected or the uh, indicators there are really ranging between 1 and 2,500 or 1 and 5,000 people. So it's, it's really pretty common. I mean, certainly when you look at um, some of the other diseases that we may have heard of, but um, the tough thing about mitochondrial disease is that oftentimes people don't look sick. You know, that the visibility of the disease itself is not as transparent as it might be with other diseases. Um, so real quick on the next slide, I just thought I'd give you an example of the timeline of mitochondrial disease. Um, it actually, you know, has existed for a while. It was in the early 1900s that, you know, it was first sort of identified. Um, however, I would say it's only been in the last 25 to 30 years that um, discoveries have occurred and there's been much more of an increased interest in the area. So it's almost like where autism or Alzheimer's may have been 25 or 30 years ago. I mean, now at this point, those are household names. Um, what I hope is that mitochondrial disease because, becomes something that people, <laughs> A, can pronounce, and B, are much more familiar with. Um, so to tell you a little bit about a quick overview, as Dr. Springer was describing Parkinson's and some of the areas that are affected, the next slide will kind of just give you um, a quick view of the body. Um, so many systems can be affected by mitochondrial disease. In fact, as Dr. Springer was indicating, some of the areas where Parkinson's shows up in terms of intestinal disorders or um, cardiac problems or um, memory problems, all of that is true, in fact, for mitochondrial disease, too. So sometimes when I've talked to people who have Parkinson's and they describe their symptoms, I sit there and I think, wow, you know, my son, who's 16 years old, has similar issues, or other families who have mitochondrial disease have similar issues. Um, so this just gives you an overview of all the different areas that potentially can be affected. Some systems are more affected than others, and then sadly, when multiple systems are impacted, um, you know, you really can have these um, difficult kind of blackouts, and it could be, you know, a chronic lifelong illness, or it could be fatal. Um, so the next slide just tells you, um, it's a little bit um, just an, another way of looking at the one we just noticed. So sometimes you'll find mitochondrial disease in diabetes clinics, like Dr. Dario was talking about earlier, unexplained heart failure, unexplained kidney disease. Um, the, the road to diagnosis for mitochondrial disease is often very long and arduous because it can present itself in so many different ways and look like so many other diseases. So oftentimes um, doctors and clinicians have a really hard time, you know, giving it a quick and easy label. 
Uh, and so um, the next slide, you know, talks about what are some of those results, right? If it's primarily brain, heart, and muscle that are affected, the results can end up being fatigue, um, developmental delays, poor growth, thyroid problems, um, muscular weakness, um, dementia, um, you know, attention problems. And so all of it, again, is overlaid by good, good and bad days. It's like the electricity flickering, you know, at different times and in different areas of the community. Um, so the next slides just really talk about how people are referred. Sometimes people ask me, you know, how do you get diagnosed for this or where do you go? Often people start with their internist or their pediatrician. Um, you know, these are some of the things that show up for children, right? There's hypotonia, so their muscle weakness, or their seizures, or the developmental delays, or maybe there's some abnormal MRI images. Um, sometimes infants might have failure to thrive, or the GI dysmotility is a really big one, um, just like Dr. Springer was saying, an intestinal um, complication for people with Parkinson's. Well, in adults, it may show up as fatigue, or muscle pain, or nerve pain. Um, so there are multiple systems in many different organs that might not necessarily seem related. And if you can imagine, you know, oftentimes these adults have been living their whole lives with a variety of symptoms, but finally they get diagnosed at 40 years old or 55 years old, um, when in fact things have just sort of accumulated over time. And it's almost like there's a triggering event that allows them to cross this threshold of expression. And finally it shows up in a way that the, the doctors can really um, label it. Um, so uh, the next slide just talks a little bit briefly about how we're diagnosed, how mitochondrial patients are diagnosed. And uh, so it really involves metabolic testing, so blood, urine, cerebral, spinal fluid, um, muscle testing. Often there's this has been this gold standard of a muscle biopsy, although things like that are changing now. I would even say in the past five or six years since my child had his muscle diagnosis or muscle biopsy back in 2008, you know, that's not necessarily uh, the only and surefire way to di diagnose mitochondrial disease. Genetic testing is important. So it's really a big picture that people have to look at, and that's why it gets very complicated. Um, but those are those are the approaches currently. Uh, there is new research uh, currently occurring in terms of diagnostics with blood tests, with saliva tests, um, new genetic testing, things called next generation sequencing and exome testing. All of those are you know, increasingly sophisticated means for identifying both genetic and um, bioenergetic uh, functions and, and malfunctions. Um, so that, that really um, gives you an overview of mitochondrial diseases and um, hopefully I haven't uh, made it more complicated than it already sounded. In this way. Uh, wonderful, Laura. Well, thank you so much. Um, and you, this is really helpful. It's all of our listeners can hear about Parkinson's being a movement disorder, mitochondrial disease. It can affect so many different systems. So, Dr. Springer, you know, talk to us more about the origins of Parkinson's and that connection between mitochondrial disease and Parkinson's. You know, I really want to talk about the risk factors, um, and, and certainly age is the most important risk factors as disease prevalence increases significantly with, with age. And um, another risk factor is a positive family history, and, and research in, into those families has really spurred a lot of um, new findings uh, in terms of what are the causes of, of Parkinson's disease, one of which is certainly male gender. Um, and certain ethnicities have a, a higher risk of Parkinson's disease. There's an, an odd inverse correlation between smoking and caffeine intake. And speaking of environmental factors in addition to genetic factors, there are a lot of substances like herbicide and pesticides that have been shown to cause some sort of Parkinsonism. Um, on the next slide is a is one of these examples um, which has been identified in the, in the 1980s in individuals who injected themselves with a, a synthetic form of heroin, they had a side product in, in those um, in, in this form of heroin that um, it's called MPTP, um, and it has been found to cause loss of dopaminergic neurons. So, in addition to to genes that can cause or mutations in genes that can cause Parkinson's disease, there are also some um, environmental 
effects or substances that can mimic or in, um, lead to the same symptoms as Parkinson's disease. Um, on the next slide, just very quickly, I want to give you an overview of, um, as of today, we have probably more than 20 genes that have been identified um, um, in, from families um, that have individuals with Parkinson's disease, and this is really important that um, patients participate in research um, just from simple blood um, samples of those patients and the analysis of their um, DNA by sequencing, um, researchers could find genes and certain mutations that are linked to Parkinson's disease and are inherited in either autosomal dominant or autosomal recessive fashion. Um, the problem we are facing right now, although we know those genes and these have been identified, we hardly know anything about really the, the function of the protein that is expressed from those genes as well as any biological function of um, of, of those proteins or biological pathways in, in a more cellular context or in an organismal context. I want to talk later on about two more of those, pink and parking, that are really linked to one biological pathway. On the next slide, we see a nice overview that kind of connects a lot of those genes that have been identified in different forms of familial Parkinson's disease, um, environmental factors, that is these toxins I mentioned, that most of them are mitochondrial toxins, but also aging, that all have been shown to have some sort of an influence on, on mitochondrial function or to, when mutated or when patients are exposed or cells are exposed, um, can cause mitochondrial dysfunction and that comes in, in various flavors or mitochondria are so complex um, organelles in the cells that are regulated by a lot of different factors. And one, one pathway that seems to be really important is, is a so-called mitochondrial quality control pathway that um, ensures that mitochondria stay healthy or identifies damaged mitochondria to remove them from, from the cell. And that's illustrated in the next slide. And it kind of rather looks um, a busy and, and, and complicated slide, but let me assure you it's just a snippet of what we know since uh, the discovery a couple of years ago of this pathway, um, that these two genes that are lost or mutated in Parkinson's disease um, basically together functionally cooperate and, and mediate a pathway that would control um, the removal of damaged mitochondria in, in terms of to prevent accumulation of those damaged mitochondria and eventually um, prevent cell death. So if these um, genes or proteins are mutated, then damaged uh, mitochondria would accumulate over time and, and, and harm the cell. So these are two proteins that are lost in, in Parkinson's and um, PINK is a, is a kinase, an enzyme that adds a phosphate to other proteins and Parkin is an ubiquitin ligase um, that adds ubiquitin to other proteins. Ubiquitin is a small protein modifier, so both Proteins mediate a lot of post-translational modifications that are important to regulate protein function in the cell. And, and, and usually both of those proteins are inhibited in the cell or not responsive unless they're stressed. So um, when stress, what we see in the, in the bottom of the picture, when there's mitochondrial stress, then pink um, accumulates as the kinase on the on the outer surface of the mitochondria and it phosphorylates so that this is its en enzyme function it phosphorylates parkin and it also phosphorylates ubiquitin and then parkin translocates from the cytoplasm of the cell specifically to damaged mitochondria and then both proteins cooperate to build those polyubiquitin chains which are indicated with those little um, blue dots and then these become phosphorylated and the recent um, research over the recent couple of years have shown that specifically this signal um, is specific to damaged mitochondria and mediates their selective degradation from the entire network of, of mitochondria. Um, in the next slide, I want to give you just an overview of um, um, we have developed an, a novel antibody that specifically recognizes those phosphorylated forms of ubiquitin and, and um, it acts basically is a biomarker of mitochondrial damage. So these are from post-mortem brain studies. And in a young control, we hardly see any signal um, highlighted by those two arrows. Whereas in a, in a um, control individual um, with 93 years, the cell is really loaded with 
uh, phosphoubiquitin, which is a marker of damaged mitochondria. So we can assume there's a lot of accumulation of damaged mitochondria or problems in the degradation of those damaged mitochondria. And when we do co-labelings, uh, um, again, this phosphorylated form of ubiquitin is in brown, um, and, and we see, for example, in the middle mitochondria, we stain those in blue, we see there's some overlap. Only a few mitochondria that are damaged are, really, are, um, are labeled by this um, mitophagy tag, um, and there's a greater overlap with, um, with lysosomal markers where those labeled mitochondria would eventually be transported to um, in order to be degraded. Wonderful. So, Dr. Springer, thank you so much for that. It seems like the, really the bottom line from all of this is that a lot of the pathophysiology, the cause of Parkinson's disease is you know, preventing mitochondrial damage and removing damaged mitochondria so they're not building up. So, Laura, I want you to just really quickly talk about this uh, project that you've co-founded with FMM and the Michael J. Fox Foundation and what sure. it's doing. Right. Well, um, you know, it looks like that if we can improve the mitochondrial function, then that's going to benefit diseases like Parkinson's as well of, of, as, of course, mitochondrial disease. So um, if we look on the next slide, we just have a couple of points here that reminds us how important um, the brain is in terms of needing energy. And, you know, it's particularly vulnerable to changes. The brain actually uses over 20% of our body's total energy requirements. So once again, if the mitochondria are responsible for making energy and regulating this energy metabolism and the pathways that Dr. Springer was just describing, you know, they're playing this pivotal role. And so that has led to FMM's interest in collaborating with related disease groups organizations like the Michael J. Fox Foundation. And so on the next slide, we have just a brief overview, and Dr. Springer is going to get into much more detail. But in 2014, the Michael J. Fox Foundation and FMM partnered to co-fund research that was going to mutually benefit um, our, each of our diseases because we're focused on the common denominator, which again are the mitochondria. So Dr. Springer's project was funded as part of a broad initiative that the Michael J. Fox Foundation has had to understand Parkin and what it can mean you know, for um, maintaining healthy mitochondria and therefore, as Dr. Springer learns more, then we are hopeful that his research will lead to um, possibilities of uh, drug treatments and therapy targets that will, again, um, rectify the, the damaged mitochondria, both in the Parkinson's patient and the mitochondrial disease patient. Um, so um, just briefly, the, the slide um, next just describes the project. Um, it was called um, the identification of Parkin activators through the structural function analysis. Um, so Dr. Springer, tell us more about it. Sure, thank you. So um, we're getting into more details um, from the cell to really individual molecules and I mentioned that um, the pathway is a good pathway and we want to activate it in order to ensure the selective degradation of damaged mitochondria. And on the next slide, we see um, a, a structural view of, of this protein I've been talking about, parkin. In the upper panel, you see just a schematic drawing of, of um, um, this polypeptide. And on top, there are a lot of different point mutations that uh, have been shown to cause Parkinson's disease. And in the bottom lower two, uh, figures you see um, an atomic all atom resolution of this protein. So this is how Parkin looks, and it's it's clear that it's it has a very close structure. And 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 research have shown that it basically has no activity. So it comes back to there needs to be some certain mitochondrial damage in order to activate pink and and which consequently then activates Parkin. And in, in this conformation, Parkin cannot have any enzymatic activity. And you see that it's literally both folded back onto itself. Um, on, the, on the left side is shown a surface view of the molecule, just to give you an idea how this would look a more three-dimensional. And on the right side, it, it's folded as a, as a polypeptide, the individual um, domains. On, on the next slide, so this is basically showing the strategy that we wanted to pursue in order to act find activators of this protective protein. So we started out with this structure I just showed you on the previous slide, and we wanted to identify 
drugs that would help us open up parking, getting it into more active and more protective um, conformation. So what we did is we performed what is called molecular dynamic simulation and um, a computational way to predict opening conformation or conformations of parking. We generated more than 30,000 different conformations um, from, from the program and then in, in, in silico design for parking activators, we uh, identified drugs on everything on the computer at this stage that would be able to bind to parking and, and um, eventually act as a wedge to keep it open, to keep it in a more active, active state. And then we screened 250,000 compounds from a larger library. We selected those compounds on just based on good chemical properties and also um, specific um, factors that would be important for central nervous system, such as the, the compounds would cross um, the blood-brain barrier. And, and so we identified and ranked those proteins. But after this prediction or computational analysis on the next slide, we really wanted to see if these compounds that we have predicted are active. And, and what we're using in the, in, in the lab is um, um, it's a lot of cell culture, and we look. We're using microscopes, and we're also using automated microscopes in order to perform those um, experiments in an unbiased way. Some of this is automated or semi-automated, uh, and and what you can see is in green is parkin. This is labeled with a green fluorescent protein, and in the first panel where it says zero hour CCCP parkin is in the cytoplasm. Um, in red, you see. Um, Tom 20. This is a mitochondrial marker, and upon a chemical damage of, of those cells of those mitochondria, if you just follow the road down. You see that the green signal starts to show a punctate st uh, um, staining and overlap with mitochondria. So this is indicative of there's mitochondrial damage, and as a result, pink and parkin are activated, and parkin translocates to those mitochondria to fulfill its enzymatic action. Um, we eventually degrade those damaged mitochondria. And we've been starting out doing this with individual cells, and now um, we're doing this in, in a multi-cell or multi-well um, plate format. We've started out with a 96-well plate that's shown on the, on the, on the right side, um, and we miniaturized it further down to 24 or 15, 36-well plate format. So it allows us a lot of throughput, and we can a lot, look at a lot of different compounds or conditions. Um, to find substances that would activate parkin. And on the next slide is, is a view into one of those wells of, of these um, multi-well plays where you can basically see the same on the left side is the positive control. So we have a lot of mitochondrial damage. And you see this punctate uh, pattern of, of the signal um, indicative of parkin activation and translocation to those mitochondria. And then we choose the different goals of mitochondrial damage where parkin is not if, uh, effectively activated, that's the middle panel. So it still diffuse the signal. And when we incubated, took those conditions and incubated the, the parking activators or enhancers of activity that we predicted on the, on the computer screen, then it kind of reflects the positive control. So there's a lot more parking activation and a lot more translocation of parking to damaged mitochondria. And um, on the further next slide, we see basically um, how the screening would look like from the predicted compounds we're using. We, we um, have a range of those compounds from each of those wells that we look at, and it's about probably 500 cells per well that we look at in triplicate um, over different plates, and then quantify the activation of, of parking and identify all those bits on, on these small molecules that are listed in, in blue. And through further um, research and validation, there's a lot of biochemical tests and a lot of cell biological tests. And it's an iterative process where we rank those compounds and go back to the structural prediction to refine those molecules. And then again, another round of functional cell-based testing. And after six or seven rounds, um, this iterative process, structure function by structure, we ended up as, in the next slide, which is one example, um, uh, with some drugs that brought us from initially probably 100 micromolar 
activity of this drug in cells down to the nanomolar range of, of an activator. And now we started to also improve our assays and multiplex several of those readouts and into one well of those multi-well uh, players and look at uh, different ways of protein activity or activation of the mitochondrial quality control pathway. So in blue, we would measure and look at the, um, um, the efficiency of the drug to activate Parkin in terms of its translocation to mitochondria, and then the black line represents um, basically in readout the generation of those phosphorylated ubiquitin chains that I've showed you earlier with the antibody, and that's a readout of really direct enzymatic activity of pink and Parkin. And then we can look at cell viability uh, at the same time just to ensure we don't pick up any unwanted side effects of those small molecules that we're developing. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Springer, talking to us about the role of those two, uh, those two and the role of Parkin in, in, in these conditions. Now, Bill, I want you to talk to us, because we've talked about the science side of this and the history side of this. Talk to us about what it's like to, to be living with Parkinson's. What do you do day to day? You know, what's our hope on the horizon? Well, thank you. It's great to be a part of this presentation. Um, I was diagnosed 10 years ago, um, and it's been an interesting 10 years for me. Uh, early on, I got involved with the Michael J. Fox Foundation. Which... Hello. Yep. Keep going. Just speak up so we can all hear you really well, please. want to hear your story. OK. Uh, tell me. Uh, if, I, if I'm not loud enough, I'm having my voice today. That's great, the way you are right now. It's perfect. Early on, being part of the Michael J. Fox Patient Council, I was exposed to a lot of activity. And I think the most important part is that we're making a lot of progress. Um, you can see in the last two or three years, that the patients have become more and more involved. Um, originally, uh, Fox started a uh, uh, program uh, uh, collecting biomarkers for the start. And since then, we have been involved in um, a test using uh, 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 wearable um, um, watches and whatnot to collect data. So, uh, in a nutshell, I think there's three things that I see. It's research, and there's more research and collective uh, uh, work between the diseases and between the, the various. Um, uh, universities and whatnot. And yes. Now I see them exposed to the fact that there are a number of compounds and devices that improve the, the quality of life for us living with Parkinson's. Um, I think if the, if you're diagnosed with Parkinson's today versus 10 years ago, there's an awful good chance that you're going to live a longer and better life. And I know the focus is on um, being able to follow the progress and eventually have a cure. And I really believe that that's within reach. That That's wonderful. I love what you said. I mean, that's how fascinating that the progress has been so quick. And if you're diagnosed with Parkinson's today versus 10 years ago, in you know, your, your prognosis is so different and the life that you can live is so different. That's so exciting in relation to the research that's going on. So Laura, I want you to just build on that really quickly. Tell us more about the co-founded research projects. Absolutely. So I think just like Bill described that there's much progress made in the last 10 years. Um, on our next slide, you'll see um, just a quick overview of that mitochondrial medicine drugs or uh, mitochondrial drugs are making a more and more significant 
play in the drug market. Um, the targets are there. So, you know, if I think about when my son was first diagnosed in 2009, I mean, when we heard about this, we, of course, went to Dr. Google, um, which, no offense to Google, but it was just, you know, heartbreaking because all we found on the internet were just these horror stories of that our child is not going to live past the age of 13. And, um, you know, that, that certainly isn't the case. He's 16 years old now and not quite sure what's going to happen in the future. But um, certainly I agree with Bill. There is a lot of hope and there's much more attention, uh, much more drugs that are forthcoming. And a couple of other things just to highlight, I think not only um, on the next slide you'll see, uh, not only do we have increased mitochondrial-based clinical trials, if you're interested in those, you can find out about those at clinicaltrials.gov. Um, organizations like ours are doing what, just what Bill described, collaborating with other um, similarly interested groups um, so that we can co-fund these therapeutic drug discovery projects like we did with the Michael J. Fox Foundation, like we've done with the Alzheimer's Drug Discovery Foundation. And um, most excitingly, on the next slide I have an image of something new that our organization is leading. Um, actually, I think, yep, yeah, there we go, Brent, um, that we're leading um, a new partnership with the University of Alabama in Birmingham and, and Seahorse Bioscience out of Boston. So Seahorse is a biotech company that focuses on diagnostics and instrumentations. And what's exciting is the people at University of Alabama have discovered a blood test that assesses mitochondrial function. So two things we are doing, we are going to launch a um, mitochondrial medicine clinical program at UAB. UAB has a fabulous clinical and research program in neurology, neurosciences, and mitochondrial medicine. And there we believe that we'll not only be able to address the causes and the mechanisms um, of the diseases that are impacted by mitochondria through this blood test that I just mentioned, but also in the clinic. So right now, patients who have mitochondrial disease don't really have a one-stop shop where they can be seen um, by clinicians. That You have to see multiple doctors. And so our hope is that at this clinic that's going to be quarterbacked, if you will, by a nurse navigator, a nurse practitioner, um, to really be the case manager and interface for the neurologist and the gastroenterologist and the pain management specialist and the physical therapy and occupational therapy, all of that under one roof. So that clinic, we um, are currently um, raising funds to support this uh, program. Um, FMM has con committed to contributing $250,000 this year for that program. Seahorse Bioscience is also contributing funds and in-kind instrumentation, and UAB, of course, is making contributions in terms of facilities, but um, this is going to revolutionize mitochondrial care in the southeast and, and frankly, nationwide. I mean, anyone can um, go to this clinic, so we're hopeful that this clinic um, with, with funding will open here in the next several months. Um, and we're looking forward to that. So um, that's really what gives me hope on the horizon. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, and I want to just talk really quickly about some great things that we have going on. with ShareCare Foundation, Foundation for Mitochondrial Medicine is, of course, a great partner of ours. And ShareCare.com, it's a, a health engagement profile to be your own personal health profile. And, you know, go check it out at ShareCare.com. Take the real age test. Find out what your own body's real age is, and then you get information on it. Of course, some great resources here. And we have time for just a couple of questions that I want to make sure we get a chance to ask because I know we have registrants from everywhere from Canada to Australia to California and in between. So since we're short on time, we're going to take questions that were submitted already. Um, if anybody wants to submit questions, of course, you still may. And uh, we may not be able to answer those live right now, but we will definitely answer them afterwards. And of course, tweet those at foundmm or info at mitochondrialdiseases.org. But let's just dive in with the first one. And, you know, Dr. Springer, just really quickly, can you tell us to what extent does the mitochondrial disease and disorders increase the risk of developing Parkinson's in a patient who already probably has that Parkinson's mutation you talked about? Sure. Um, although I'm actually you know, really good answer because I think it just has not been fully established so far. I mean, there are mitochondrial DNA mutations that are found also in those remaining cells in, in Parkinson's disease, and I guess having a mutation um, 
does not necessarily mean you'll get the disease. It only increases the risk to some certain, you know, a higher probability of, of getting the disease. What is intriguing, though, is um, for this ping and parkin pathway that I was mentioning, that those proteins are expressed in each and every cell. And, and we've seen that this mitochondrial quality control pathway is active in different cells and different tissues. Um, but still, loss of those proteins results in Parkinson's disease and really loss of those dopaminergic neurons. So I don't know if it really underscores the selective vulnerability of some cells to, to these kind of insults or a, a, that these cells have a higher burden of mitochondrial damage. Um, and, and that's why loss of proteins in those cells um, results in degeneration of this specific neurons. Okay, thank you. You're right. It, it's definitely multiple factors coming to play and combining together for somebody who's already possibly susceptible and then has a secondary damage. Um, in our last couple of minutes, uh, Bill and Laura, you know, any advice for newly diagnosed patients with Parkinson's? Um, from a clinical standpoint, it's the most important thing for a patient to be a neurologist geared to uh, movement disorder. Mm -hmm. So find a neurologist who really knows a lot about movement disorders? Okay, that's very helpful. Yeah, absolutely, getting to the right person. Laura, what do you think? Yeah, I think so too. Um, I think what we're finding is um, the neurologist is often where uh, the patients are able to, in some ways, have exposure or uncover more possibilities. Um, so a patient or a, a clinician who's specialized in movement disorders for Parkinson's patients or other neurological diseases, a pediatric neurologist or an adult neurologist is a great place to start. Um, I also think we're seeing some certainly interest in natural supplements and um, other sorts of um, treatments like that that could be helpful for patients. Right now there are no specific treatments for mitochondrial disease or mitochondrial dysfunction. Um, so people take what's often called the mitochondrial cocktail, so CoQ10 or L-carnitine or some of these other supplements. Um, and I know there was some curiosity around how that might also benefit some of the Parkinson's patients too. It's you know it's really hard to say. Every situation is different. Um, I don't think there's a lot of consistency with some of these natural substances. Um, so for example, uh, in my son's case, we were taking a lot of this mitochondrial cocktail for a long time, and it just really wasn't making a difference. And so um, I know, um, Bill, do you have any other thoughts on that? Well, I tell you one thing that's really surfaced as a major therapy is exercise. You know, we have talked about exercise for years, but now it's to the place where they're uh, through the University of, of Alabama, Birmingham, there is a test now exercise and how it can be implemented as a therapy. Um, it's it's uh, considered as important as the other aspects of medication. I think, I think that's a good physical, physical therapy is increasingly used. I know in your Parkinson's community, you've personally talked to me about that, and uh, also uh, with the mitochondrial patients. I think physical therapy, um, exercise, surprisingly. You know, a lot of our mitochondrial patients don't have the energy they need, yet, uh, once again, you know, it's almost this paradox of, you know, putting your body through exercise is actually going to, in turn, you know, improve your stamina and increase your energy. So, uh, I th I've heard the Alzheimer's uh, researchers say the same thing. You know, exercise, eat um, a balanced diet, eat the, the diet that doesn't have a lot of um, carbohydrates and um, you know more increased protein sort of the the Mediterranean diet I think is what the Alzheimer's people have indicated as well and that seems to be consistent across the board you know no processed foods and I know you at share care Daria too with the real age test um, all of that seems to tie in with 
um, what you all advocate as well. You are, you're entirely right, Laura and Bill. And you know, the role of exercise is it's something that we see lowers your real age, but it's because of the impact it has on all these conditions you're talking about. Alzheimer's to Parkinson's, they're even seeing it in, in cancer as well. So it's a great place to wrap up. I know that a lot of people have been asking if the slides will be available. So Laura, where can people find that? Sure. Um, we will have those on our YouTube account. So you can just go to YouTube um, slash foundmm. So we'll have them available there. And certainly um, you can find information on the FMM website at hopeflies.org. Uh, there you can sign up to receive our regular newsletters um, and just specifically indicate if you have particular areas of interest. So we would love to maintain contact with you through any of the social media forums through ShareCare as well. And um, we're very, very excited about all of the interest today. Thank you, all of you, for participating and getting curious. I think you know, two things I can ask us to do, and those are really sharing this information to help us spread awareness. We all need that. Uh, whether it's the Parkinson's community or the mitochondrial disease community, we need to increase awareness. And we certainly all need to increase our funding so that we can continue to support good projects like Dr. Springer's. Wonderful, Laura. Thank you. And yes, everybody go check out their site and check us out at sharecare.com. You can also find at sharecare.com, you can find the Foundation for Mitochondrial Medicines page there as well. You know, as we're talking, it's really, if we could leave everybody with one thing that so strikes me is that, you know, remember that mitochondria are in every cell. And especially in the brain, with it's a very high energy requirements, which is why we can see mitochondrial disorders in so many different body systems and why it can be so difficult to pick it up at first and why I'm so glad we are talking about it today and really gearing resources towards it. So remember, I know people had more questions. We want to make sure those get answered. Please email the team info at mitochondrialdiseases.org or tweet them at foundmm. Of course, I'm Dr. Daria. Always happy to hear from you also at Dr. Daria. Thank you so much for listening. I hope this was helpful, and I look forward to learning more. Thank you. Thank you.